I'm Laurie Cardoza-Moore, and this is Focus on Israel. Following the Holocaust, much of the world cried never again. The newly created Jewish state and America became safe havens for the Jewish people. In America, they enjoyed the benefits of personal liberty and for those from Europe and Russia, freedom from constant persecution. However, with the current rise of anti-Semitism across the U.S. and now even in the Democrat Party, we see this golden era of American Jewry quickly ending. Thank you for joining me today on Focus on Israel. I'm Lori Cardoza-Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and sharing the message of Christian biblical responsibility to the people and land of Israel in the face of a growing global anti-Semitism. PJTN was birthed to stop the silence and alert Christians and all people of conscience to the reality of a world set on destroying Israel and the Jewish people. Since 2005, PJTN has fought against this hate and will always resist those who stand against the plan of God. As you might have noticed, we're coming to you from Jerusalem, the 3,000-year-old capital of Israel. Behind me are the ancient walls of the old city of Jerusalem. Inside those walls stood the Jewish Holy Temple, originally built by King Solomon. Just 70 years after the death of Yeshua, the first attempt to exterminate the Jewish people took place. The siege of Jerusalem ended with the Roman army capturing the city and destroying both the city and its temple. Over one million Jews were massacred, with over 97,000 being exiled and enslaved. Just over 1,800 years later, the Nazi Holocaust began as another dictator attempted to wipe the Jewish race from the earth. As events unfold today, are we looking at another Holocaust? In this program, you'll hear from Holocaust survivors who fear that never again has been forgotten in America and alarmingly by the very political party they have long supported. Jewish immigrants who came to America between 1880 and 1920 quickly gravitated to Democratic politicians, who they perceived as best representing their interests. Jews began to channel their energy to liberal causes and led Jews to support and become leaders in socially progressive causes. The attitudes generated by social concerns quickly spilled over into politics. Most Jews have voted for the Democrat presidential candidate in every race for more than a century. Although Franklin Roosevelt had a number of Jewish advisors, he did nothing to hinder the Nazi campaign to decimate all of European Jewry. He didn't bomb the gas chambers or even the railroads leading to them. Jews who were part of the greatest generation of World War II would not acknowledge this at the time or in the following decades. Today, the party which they have so long endorsed has become unrecognizable. From the 1970s until the attacks of 9-11, Democrats and Republicans shared a similar level of support for Israel. However, based on a series of polls in 2009, the level of support by the two parties for the Jewish state has seen a significant and widening split. Since the 2018 midterm elections, a furious debate over American support for Israel has been raging. On one side, Republicans introduced the Strengthening America's Security in the Middle East Act. This bill denies state contracts to or bars state investments with American individuals or groups who support the anti-Semitic BDS movement. On the other side, a Michigan Democrat and the first Palestinian American in Congress, Rashida Tlaib, tweeted that the bill's sponsors forgot what country they represent. 
In February, Representative Ilhan Omar, a freshman Democrat from Minnesota and a Somali-American, spoke at a fundraiser for Islamic Relief in Tampa, Florida. It was billed as an event to help victims of the war in Yemen. But in April, the German government announced that it had found significant ties between the aid group and the Muslim Brotherhood, an underground terrorist group. In another tweet, Omar stated that American politicians' defense of Israel was all about the Benjamins. Despite the backlash she received from that insult, she has continued to make remarks that are flatly Jew-hating. On March 23rd, she spoke in Los Angeles at a fundraiser for CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, a group with ties to long-established terrorist groups, including Hamas, Hezbollah, and the PLO. They were also listed as an unindicted co-conspirator in the largest terrorist fundraising operation in U.S. history. She unleashed a firestorm when she said, CARE was founded after 9-11 because they recognized that some people did something and that all of us were starting to lose access to our civil liberties. On April 11th, the New York Post responded with their interpretation of some people did something. Omar has powerful apologists for her in Congress, including Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who said on April 14th that, I don't think that the Congresswoman is anti-Semitic. I wouldn't even put those in the same category. She also commented that there is no taint of anti-Semitism in the Democrat Party. Another member who seeks to minimize Omar's hate speech is Senator Bernie Sanders, who said that it is not anti-Semitic to be critical of a right-wing government in Israel. But it is. This is the same well-known strategy that Islamists and the boycott, divest, and sanctions movement use to justify their anti-Jewishness. That is, it's all right to criticize Israel as a nation because it doesn't imply anything negative about Jews. As early as 2012, during one of Israel's wars with Hamas in Gaza, Omar tweeted, Israel has hypnotized the world. May Allah awaken the people and help them see the evil doings of Israel. This bizarre statement plays into another old trope, that of Jews as behind the scenes manipulators and evil puppet masters. She has been widely criticized for her comments, but not by Democrat leaders or presidential candidates. Among those, perhaps her greatest supporter is her colleague, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a New York Democrat. She criticized her own party leaders when they attempted to create a resolution to condemn Omar. In response to objections from AOC and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, the final resolution was watered down to condemn anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of bigotry. The result was pointless as it related to Omar's prejudice. In response to this, President Trump told reporters, the Democrats have become an anti-Israel party. They've become an anti-Jewish party. This new position toward Israel, first initiated by Barack Obama, has now moved forward as the Democrat party is renouncing its historic support for Israel. It is no longer the party of Harry Truman who recognized the rebirth of the modern state of Israel just 11 minutes after its independence was declared. Is it rational, let alone wise, for Jews to support this new Democrat party? And for how much longer will there be a place for them at this table? American Jews must wake up before their complacency becomes another example of having their collective head in the sand. German Jews paid a dear price. Still, there are many Jews who see the truth and many who have experienced the dangerous slippery slope of anti-Semitism. During a recent visit to Florida, I had the privilege to speak with several survivors of the Nazi Holocaust. Eric and Ilse Ehrenheim were both born in Germany in 1925 and 1929 and fled from Nazi-controlled territory. I also met with two Hungarian Jews, John and Daisy Mary. Daisy was born in Morocco and John in Budapest, Hungary in 1940. All had quiet childhoods, but experienced the dramatic rise in European anti-Semitism after 1933. Their difficult escape from Europe is a warning to us today 
about how quickly society can be influenced by the hate of a few. They express their fears about what is happening in America today. My father was um, the youngest child of a family of three kids. He could not study in Hungary because they had definitely anti-Semitic rules, which meant it was called numerus clausus, which means in Latin, the numbers are closed. So that means that the Jewish children could not continue their education in Hungary. So he went to Italy and he married my mother and he returned to Hungary. And my maternal and paternal grandparents were very upset because my father said he did not want to stay in Hungary. And they said, why, we're Hungarians, nothing can happen to us. But my father said, no. And you know what really scared him the most? The cartoons. The cartoons where they portrayed the Jews with the big noses and counting the money. And unfortunately, this is happening right now. The cartoons have reappeared. It happens in Hungary. We see cartoons of the Jews be portrayed as blood-sucking insects with blood coming through their jaws. And uh, we realize that whatever happened then, it's happening again. The Holocaust came to Hungary late, but in a very, very fast and furious uh, progression. What took place in Poland in three and a half years took place in Hungary in 54 days. The last place to be deported was Budapest, at which point uh, uh, my uncle was a Zionist and the Zionists uh, had some experience in uh, dealing with the Germans and some negotiations were established. And in this group, which 14 members of my family were uh, involved uh, a group of 1,648 Jews left Budapest in uh, June of 1944. We didn't know exactly where we were going, but 10 days later we arrived at a place in northern Germany, a place that was called Bergen-Belsen. We were there for uh, five months. Uh, Dr. Kastner negotiated and negotiated for our release. Uh, to the last minute, we didn't know whether it would be successful, but it was. And we arrived in uh, Switzerland in December of 1944. And uh, we were one of the first refugees to come to the United States. And we came on a Liberty ship. We observed Passover 1946 on the Liberty ship. And again, we were the first refugees to arrive in, uh, in the United States after World War II. I think anti-Semitism has increased in the last couple of years. I think it has to be nipped in the bud, and I don't think we're uh, getting enough leadership from the top. A member of Congress uh, utters anti-Semitic remarks. You have to call it what it is and not blend it in with all kinds of other issues. I think history is repeating itself, and we have to put a stop. And the only way we can put a stop if we have un unity. Everybody should unite and try to, to uh, kill this uh, horrible disease, which is anti-Semitism. My name is Ilse Arenheim. I was born in a little town in Germany along the Rhine River. Uh, the first few years of my life were very uneventful. No one in the family ever thought about Hitler until about 1933 or 1934 when uh, there was an election. And I remember my mother and my grandparents sitting around a table saying, how could there be every vote for Hitler where we voted when the three of us knew that we didn't vote for him? But they didn't think that much of it. My mother fortunately remarried a man around 1935 who immediately said, we cannot raise a daughter in Germany. He was one of the few Jewish people who saw what was coming. Nobody believed him. My mother's family thought she had married a crazy man. He was an ardent Zionist, but we couldn't get into what was called Palestina then, now Israel,
because the British wouldn't allow it. It wasn't that the Germans didn't allow us to leave. The Germans said, go, leave us everything. But it was very difficult to get into any other country. My father became desperate when many of the Jewish people thought he was absolutely out of his mind. My father, by a miracle, got the papers and we got on the ship. We said goodbye to my grandparents. Never saw them again. They were deported to Minsk. And from there, we don't know. We know the end result that they were killed, but we don't know where. We came to America. We love America. My name is Eric Ehrenheim. I've been married to Ilse for 70 good years. I was born in 1925. My father owned a very large department store. People were being told, don't buy from Jews. And finally, they placed a guard, an armed guard in front of the store, and nobody could come in. Of course, my father had to close the store. Uh, we were awakened in the middle of the night with uh, banging and broke breaking glass downstairs our store. All the, we could see from our window, all the merchandise was being thrown into the streets. And finally there was a knocking at our apartment, at our little room, and four SS army men marched their way, forced their way in, beat my father, threw him down the four flights of stairs, and dragged him to the local police. And the next morning, he was transferred to the uh, concentration camp. Then they came, after they took my father to prison, they came back for me. I was 13 at the time, beat me and dragged me to jail, but I was more fortunate, I did not go to the Dachau concentration camp where they sent my father. Eventually, they allowed me to go home because my papers had come through to go with the children's transport to Sweden. Talking to American Jews, they don't believe it can happen anywhere in the world. So I do see a relationship between what's, what's happening, and I'm very, very afraid. What scares me even more, if such a thing could be, than what these women in Congress are saying, anti saying is that so many people in Congress, silently or not, are agreeing with them. They're the ones that scare me. And I remember my father saying, you can say all you want, you're not Jewish, but the world will always see you as Jewish. I cannot make them understand how serious it is for American Jews not to love Israel. Israel is, if one day we were told to leave America, and God forbid that should ever happen, where would we go? We have only one place that will take us. Face realism and don't say it can't happen here because that's what we said and we learned uh, the, the hard way of what happens. It, it's just for the rest of my days, I will tell people to keep their eyes open and vote for the right, right person and fight anti-Semitism because that's the beginning. It's not anti-Semitism. So it doesn't stop there. It ruins the world if we don't open our eyes and face reality. I, I feel very strongly that the president that we have now, President Trump, will do everything he can. Trump is the best friend American president Israel ever had. Without American support, there would be no Israel. 
I want to take you to Israel in pictures and film. I want you to see how God's sovereign hand can be seen before our eyes right here in this land. That's why PJTN is offering a special anniversary package that includes a captivating new book and award-winning DVD. Israel Rising is a unique visual story of Israel's miraculous journey from unforgiving desert to thriving nation. Thousands of years ago, the prophet Ezekiel foretold a future time in which the arid land of Israel would come alive for its people. Now this breathtaking book documents the fulfillment of this vision as rarely seen photographs from the 1880s to the 1940s are juxtaposed with recent photos of the same locations. This book will inspire and captivate you as it illuminates Israel's foretold awakening in a new and unforgettable way. In addition, you'll receive the award-winning documentary, Israel Indivisible, The Case for the Ancient Homeland. This inspiring film examines the many political twists and turns that make Israel the world's most controversial nation. From Abraham and the promise to the issues facing the Jewish state today, the film examines the historical, archeological, legal, and biblical foundations for the modern state of Israel. This is a limited time offer for these two remarkable resources for just a one-time gift of $70 today. Your generous donation will help ensure that PJTN stays on the front lines and in the headlines of all the important issues facing Israel and our Jewish brethren. So please go to PJTN.org today. Our next interview is with Miriam Papipa, a survivor of Auschwitz. She was born in the former Czechoslovakia. Her story is harrowing, inching from a normal home life to deportation to a death camp. She ends by imploring us to fight anti-Jewish hatred even now and compares our present situation with how events unfolded in her town. May 18, we got to Auschwitz. I remember the place where it said, Albeit macht die. And I recall my mother saying, you know, children, it's not going to be so bad. Once they took us off the, the red train, we saw musicians all in striped clothes. They were playing music. I mean, they did everything possible to keep us quiet because they didn't want us to know what's happening next. As they walked us to a line, they started to separate us. There was this man, Dr. Mengele, I recall, I remember him. When it came the line to me and my mother, my sister was in black, I made myself crippled, look crippled, because I wanted to go with my mother. A mangler hit my shoulder and said to me in German, how old are you? I said, 13. He looked at me and said, stram genug, and pulled me to the left, strong enough, and my mother to the right. My mother walked away, like about three, four feet, still in the cold, and turned around and said to my sister, Eva, take care of the child. Those were her last words. Finally, I was taken to a site with about 24 girls. I was one of the lucky ones. They put me back into the line. They left there about 10 girls, 12, I don't know. After that, we found out the Nazis abused them and killed them. Next morning, there was a Polish girl, a young girl, a couple, who was taken before. And I walked up to her and I said, could you please tell me, when am I going to see my mother? She looked at me. She says, you want to see your mother? Come, I'll show you. She walked me to the entrance, and she said, do you smell this smoke? I said, yes. She says, do you see these chimneys? I said, yes. 
says, this is where your mother is burning now. That was it. I was in Auschwitz, and it scares me because we are starting to relive the past. But the biggest problem now, what I find, is that there is somehow nobody who could really hit that button and say, it's enough. It's growing. Please, stop the anti-Semitism. Look and say one thing, never again. I say never again, never forget, never forgive. Don't let it happen. I do follow that Omar on Facebook. I'm very much, very much afraid, but I still cannot understand one thing. Out of so many smart people in the United States, how did they take an anti-Semit? Again, I could only say one thing. Please, remember what happened. Let it not happen again. We are strong Americans. We are freedom people. Are we going to let this happen? Well, that's our program for today. And I want you to know we appreciate your support. The time to take a stand is now. Be a leader in your community and in your church. One person can make a difference. Get involved with and support pro-Israel organizations such as PJTN. Call your senators, congressmen, let your elected leaders hear from you. Visit our website to learn more. Sign up to receive free action alerts and order our films to share with family and friends. Please encourage everyone you know to tune in and become informed. God bless you and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren and all Israel. We'll see you next time on Focus on Israel. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, P.O. Box 682711, Franklin, Tennessee, 37068. You can also support PJTN online. Visit PJTN.org or call 1-877-873-9020. Anti-Semitism has reached epic proportions, and Israel is now surrounded by nations who seek its destruction. For Israel to lose just one battle would mean losing everything. As Christians, it is our biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren and Israel. PJTN needs your help to reach more Christians with this urgent message. Please visit our website to become a member today and order our award-winning documentaries you must decide that you won't be silent. Sign up now at pjtn.org. God bless you and thank you for your support and prayers.